Nasha, thank you very much. It's, it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be here. It's been such an interesting conference, and I like Minnesota so much, having spent a lot of my childhood in the Boundary Waters. So it's great. Um, where are the tools? Oh. This is a pointer and this Up, is down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so th this is joint work uh, with Eric Hanischek uh, at Stanford, Julie Cullen at University of California in San Diego, and Greg Phelan, who's a graduate student on the job market from the uh, University of Texas at Dallas. He's great. He's doing a lot of work on both higher ed um, and K-12 education. We also have a charter school paper together. So. This paper studies accountability and, and the principal labor market. And it's a little bit of economic history, education history, since NCLB is no longer uh, in force. But I think the experiences that you get from, from observing the uses of information and the responsiveness to ratings is going to be relevant to whatever system that's in place. So the passage of NCLB followed um, much state experimentation with test score accountability. You know, which emerged from, I think, a concern that weak incentives adversely affected school quality. There really appeared to be little relationship between job performance and labor market outcomes for many educators, including principals. <coughs> and so, you know, accountability was going to provide the information upon which people could be judged, and then presumably the incentives for, um, for school boards to put in place plans to remove educators who, who weren't doing well and weren't improving. Now, the potential sources of a weak association between educator effectiveness and labor market outcomes is, on the one hand, you can have little information on student performance, including test scores, on outcomes that we value. Um, there were subjective evaluations of teachers but very few received unsatisfactory ratings. So if you look at the you know, evidence on these evaluations, almost everybody is rated highly. Um, there were rigid salary schedules and strong job protections. So there really wasn't much extrinsic reward for doing well. Maybe you could signal it somehow and get a job somewhere else. Um, but but there wa it wasn't a case in which doing well, one, was easily measured, and two, would result in career advancement or, or higher compensation. Um, one of the things we're focusing on is that there's also weak incentives for administrators to take action in the face of poor performance or even to differentiate among teachers or principals on the basis of effectiveness. That conversation where you talk to somebody about the deficiencies in the way they're doing their job is a difficult conversation. Even if you're doing it to try to support them to do better, people are often hurt and resentful. And if you're doing it um, as trying to move them out um, or terminate contracts or not re renew contracts, it becomes very difficult. So if you're a tenure-protected school principal and you're going to be able to keep your job no matter what, virtually no matter what, perhaps for you, it's an easier route to make sure that your educators are happy um, than it is to take the kind of steps that might create frictions uh, among your staff and problems, even if it's educationally better for the kids. Um, uninformed school boards could contribute to the problem by lessening the information content of superintendent evaluations. I mean, one of the th I was a former school board member, and the superintendents like to be the conduit of information for you. They like to tell you what's going on in the district. And you know, the fact that, that some of us were able to actually read the Massachusetts statistical reports on the schools and have an understanding of what was going on, um, I think was seen as not so good by the superintendent. So being the, you know, the, uh, the source of information is very important. And so if the school board members don't have requisite information about the performance of the schools, you know, get information from other parents, lots of different sources, oftentimes they don't have the kind of good information upon which to make decisions, or, or good decisions. Okay, 
So Texas Accountability and No Child Left Behind require districts to generate and provide performance information. There's test score results, pass rates there, which are, which, um, you know, were the metric of choice by subject, grade, and demographic group, low income, um, ESL, black, Hispanic, and special education. Um, there are cruder ratings categories based on test scores and other factors, including attendance. They're pretty complex calculations that determine what rating the school falls into, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So they get this sort of easy to digest information of whether you are unacceptable, acceptable, recognized, or exemplary. And then there's a lot more information about proficiency rates of all the demographic groups in each grade and test score that is accessible online that people can, uh, act, you know, can look at, including uh, district administrators. Um, one of the great things about, about accountability was that it caused the creation of these large data sets at the student level where you could follow students over time and do things like look, you can look at test score growth or value added of schools, even if that wasn't the intent of the original um, enabling legislation that created um, accountability and the collection of these data. So we study the effects of performance information on the probability of principal job retention and compensation growth. And we're going to use something called regression discontinuity design, which is a great uh, method even for those of you um, who haven't seen it much, because it's, it's quite um, straightforward, I think. There's lots of details and, um, underneath the surface. But on the surface, it's quite straightforward to think about um, what this method um, produces in, in terms of estimates. Um, the regression discontinuity design estimates basically compare the labor market outcomes for two principles who lead schools with almost identical test score pass rates, but fall on opposite sides of the cutoff. Um, so for example, if the cutoff to get an acceptable rating is 80% of the kids have to pass, and you have one principal who leads a school where 79% of the kids pass, she, her, her school is going to get an unacceptable rating. You get another principal who leads a school where 80% of the kids pass, her school gets an acceptable rating. Essentially, these, these two principals have done, you know, have done an identical job, and yet they're going to be rated very differently. And one of the, th the, the main things we're going to look at in the paper is to compare the, the effects of these ratings in an environment in which there is access to information on the underlying pass rates. And if you have the information on the underlying pass rates, why would you ever reference the ratings? Right? And so that's really an important question. So why should the principal with a 79% pass rate have a lower probability of job retention or receive a lower raise than the person with the 80% pass rate who just got, you know, the 79% pass rate person got unlucky because one of her students fell one question below passing and got it wrong because they, they knew the right answer, but they circled the wrong dot, okay? One possibility is a superintendent uses only rating and does not have knowledge of the underlying pass rate information that determines the rating. So it's possible the superintendents, either because they're lazy or because you know, they're too busy or they're, they, they're not good with mathematics so they don't understand um, you know, or want to digest what these pass rates represent, they just rely upon the ratings. That's a possibility. Um, second possibility is the principal who gets who is leading the unacceptable rated school, it's almost like getting the A from Pride and Prejudice. They don't want to be in that school anymore. One, because of the stigma. Two, because as part of No Child Left Behind, if your school is rated unacceptable for multiple years, then there's a lot of restrictions and obligations that come with being the principal of that school. A third possibility and one I think is an intriguing possibility is other stakeholders, including parents and school board members, only have information on the ratings 
and pressure the district to take action. So there was a newspaper article, I think, in the Dallas Morning News where a parent said, yes, our school failed last year, but we're going to be fine because that principal was fired. Okay? So it's all about, you know, the, the, the media likely focuses on the ratings, and parents may focus on the ratings. School board members may focus on the ratings. Okay? In which case, that may prompt action by the administrators in the district on the basis of the ratings, even if they, they have more knowledge about the underlying um, pass rates in these schools. Or more than that, have more knowledge about how good a job they think the principals are doing on the basis of evaluations and discussions and other kinds of feedback. Um, in Texas, um, and this preceded NCLB, but certainly um, NCLB was the same, and it's already been discussed extensively here, that ratings are based on pass rates, not growth and achievement. And so schools are essentially divided on the basis of the lowest pass rate among the demographic group in the school that counts. In other words, a demographic group that has, meets the minimum number of, of students criteria. Um, except for the lower ratings categories in where schools can meet, um, get an acceptable rating, and in some years even a recognized rating, by improving enough that they meet required improvement um, regulations. Now, of course, pass rates and achievement levels reflect family in addition to school influences. So it's the, this notion that was talked about at lunchtime where you know, educators are held responsible for, for many things outside of their control because this kind of system of accountability doesn't distinguish very well um, the contributions of the schools, let alone particular educators, versus other things that the schools don't have control over. Um, Performance ratings based on pass rates unfairly punish principals who work in disadvantaged schools. Um, and that can, that can make it much more difficult for those schools to attract and retain educators. And that's a real problem of, of this system. Um, and it's difficult to infer the performance of the principal for measures of school outcomes. That's an issue we're really trying to tackle in other work. It's very hard because if you're trying to say how effective was a teacher at teaching math, and you have a couple of sixth grade teachers, you can kind of compare them, taking into consideration the composition of their classrooms. But with a principal, how well the school does under a principal's tenure is equivalent to how well the school was doing during that period of time. And it's, it's not so simple to try to attribute something to the principal. We're not trying to get at that issue here. We're really trying to say, you know, <clears throat> do educators have different labor market outcomes if their school gets below the, the cutoff versus above? You know, whether or not those, those ratings really reflect the kind of job that they do. Because in fact, we don't think that they do. Um, and we also study the association among arguably better measures of principal effectiveness ratings, and labor market outcomes. So we're going to show you some value-added estimates that actually um, control for differences, fixed differences among schools. Um, we're going to describe differences in pass rates in a more compelling value-added measure of principal effectiveness by ratings category. We're going to estimate the association between labor market outcomes and pass rate, value-added, and rating. Those aren't causal estimates. These are really going to going to demonstrate the associations in the, uh, in the data. And we're going to examine differences in the association between labor market success and these variables in the same and different districts. So your current employer has a lot more information about you, some of which may be online and recorded, quantitative, and other which is likely to be based on observations or feedback in climate surveys or other kinds of feedback. And so a potential employer is likely to use, have more limited information and may actually use information differently than the current employer. Okay, so the data set for the project, um, Ross Perot was the one who, who was in, you know, influential in putting these data together. He may have actually been involved in it. Um, so Texas has this very... Um, long history of, of having student-level administrative data collected in the state. 
Kids since 1993 have been tested annually in the fall in mathematics and reading and other subjects. They collect student demographic characteristics. And what's important is you can follow educators and children as they move through the system. Okay? If they switch schools, if they get promoted, uh, you can track them. We exclude principals with 24, 25 or more years of total experience. That combines teaching and other administrative work as well as being a principal. Um, to limit the influence of retirement, and we exclude the first year in a school because of the fact that um, these principals are just coming in and it's, it's difficult to, to hold them responsible for things that they largely inherited. Um, and we have over 11,000 total principal by year observations. So in the Texas accountability system, schools are rated acceptable, uh, unacceptable, recognized or exemplary based upon these pass rates, as I already said. Um, it means that, and this has been talked about a lot, at least you, you know, among educators and economists, that the more diverse you are as a school, the harder it is to get a higher rating. Right? The more likely it is that, even if it's just by chance, that one of the groups is going to fall below. They did build in some exemptions so that schools that are being judged on the basis of more groups can drop the lowest group. Um, and so we had to incorporate all of that into our efforts to replicate the accountability system. So Greg Phelan, of course, the graduate student, got stuck with this. And it took years to try to replicate the accountability ratings because there were there's so many exceptions and changes each year that you have to implement. And we didn't quite get them all because there's a few... Um, there's a few schools that get safe harbor provisions that aren't necessarily or don't seem to be written down. They may be somewhere. Um, but he really did a fantastic job and, and, you know, and, and along with his great understanding of RD was helpful um, beyond words. So schools may also meet required improvement thresholds. So even though there's accountability, Texas doesn't like to rate schools unacceptable. So only 1% of schools or rated unacceptable. Um, but there is a lot of variation beyond that. And so, you know, we're gonna, we're, you're going to see that, not surprisingly, it's the unacceptable, acceptable boundary, which is where most of the action is. But it's not like everyone in Texas gets the highest rating. And in fact, over time, as, you know, as everyone knows, more and more schools um, failed failed to make adequate yearly progress as part of No Child Left Behind, which was one of the reasons that system had to be changed. But in Texas, if anything, the fraction rated unacceptable, I think, was falling a little bit over time. So the other half of this accountability is information dissemination. So pass rates for all included tests and demographic groups are reported online for all schools. Um, and the ratings are widely disseminated and known, along with um, demographic information about the schools. The ratings are extensively discussed. If you drive around Texas, you can see you know, billboards up by school districts who do very well. Um, the accountability system does not report or calculate you know, information on value added. So the nice thing about the accountability is it enables us to do these comparisons just across boundaries. So what we call the running variable is the pass rate of the lowest scoring demographic group relative to its cutoff, be it the level or required improvement, that counts. Um, and that means they have to have at least 30 students and possibly up to 50 in that group. Um, so the running variable is based on the marginal group and the marginal subject. So some additional issues. The absence of information on salary and job offers limits inferences that can be drawn about personnel practices. So we don't know if the principal was offered a new contract. We don't know what salary they were offered. We only know whether where we observe people working and how much they're making. So if they switch schools, we don't know if the prior school had wanted to keep them or not. We can't tell whether transitions are voluntary um, or someone was not renewed. Um, because, as I said, a principal may respond to a low rating by voluntarily giving up a position. 
And ratings aren't released until August, so we focus on labor market outcomes in the second year after the release. We don't look at what happens a month later. We look at what happens. It's not really a month later because school starts in August in Texas. So we don't look at the immediate effect because we don't see how the ratings could take effect immediately. We look one year later. So what you can see here, um, this is what we call the first stage. So it's the vertical axis is the probability that you get the higher rating. So the top one here is the probability that the principal gets, that the school, because the principal doesn't get the rating, that in a year the school gets an acceptable rating. And what you could see as the running variables defined as the pass rate on the test that really determines the rating. So it's the lowest, basically, the lowest scoring group. And if you got 10 points below the cutoff, almost everyone who got 10 points below the cutoff is still acceptable. Almost nobody got, I'm sorry, still unacceptable. Almost nobody got acceptable. There's a few of the little circles that are above zero. And that means that some small fraction of schools that we say that we predict would get an unacceptable rating because they, the pass rate falls below the cutoff for acceptable, they get it. So somehow we're missing the reason that they got it. But we can predict it almost perfectly. All the schools that have the pass rate which meets the threshold for acceptable get it. And so essentially what we're doing is we're going to be using our predictions of whether they should get an acceptable or unacceptable rating right around the cutoff to learn about the effects of getting the rating, right? Because somebody who gets one point below the cutoff, that school is almost, you know, has a very high probability of being rated unacceptable. If they meet the pass rate just meets the threshold, they're going to be rated acceptable. And the same thing holds on these two other boundaries. Does anyone have any questions about this? Please ask if, if you're not clear. Um, so I'm going to skip the specification test. One of the things we worry about is. I guess there's one oh. question for you to go back. The, if you look at the other two, yeah. you don't have these errors to the left as much. Right? Yeah, I think. It's really judgmental or whatever it is thing is on that one. It's not judgmental because it has to be documented. But there seem to be around the bottom, you know, some of these what they call safe harbor provisions. And we are not identifying all of them. Right. And it's not, you know, it doesn't introduce bias into the estimation. It just makes it a little less precise. Okay. What could introduce bias is if schools could manipulate where they ended up. So if a principal who really wanted to stay in the school figured out how to move the scores above the threshold, we would have a problem. Now, I think it's very hard to manipulate that way because the tests are distributed and then sent in. And, but I guess it's possible. So we, we do um, provide a bunch of evidence that, that shows there's, there's very little reason to believe that this kind of manipulation is taking place. And I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. So here is the, probably the, one of the main findings in the paper. And if you look at the, um, the upper left diagram, what you can see is on the vertical axis is the probability the principal is retained, so that the principal is still working at that school in the year after the rating comes out. And what you can see, and those lines that go across in the center of the dashed lines, those show you the probability that the principal is retained. And you can see if you cross the boundary, the predicted probability of retention is much higher than for principals who score just below. And those are confidence intervals. And what you can see if, if I showed you the, you know, and I'll show you the table in a minute, is those are significant differences. Now, the other thing that's important is the probability of job retention at the other two thresholds moves almost completely smoothly through the cutoff. And that is, there's no change in the probability of job retention around the cutoff. Okay?
Now, the other, um, so here's the table. And what you could see is, and something with RD is bandwidth means how much of the area to each, how much distance to each side of the cutoff do we use in making these estimates? And the narrower the area, the better because we want to be comparing people just on opposite sides of the cutoff. And so if you look at 2.5 percentage points, so this sample only includes people within 2.5 percentage points of the cutoff, or the optimal, which is close to that, you see large and highly significant estimated effects of getting an acceptable rating on job retention of around 40 percentage points. If you go to the other boundaries, those numbers fall to two percentage points and are not statistically significant. So what's clear is that there's no effect of crossing a ratings boundary. You know, it, it's hard to reject the hypothesis that there's no effect at the recognized and exemplary boundaries, but a very large effect at the acceptable boundary. Now, here's the change in salary if you cross the boundary. So, does a principal whose school crosses a boundary, on average, does that raise salary? Not surprisingly, for the crossing the acceptable rating, the answer is yes. Part of that may be because they get lower raises as a principal. Part of that is because a number of these educators leave their jobs as principals and go back to teaching or working as other types of administrators for lower pay. If you look at the recognized boundary, you see, again, virtually no jump at all when you cross the threshold. And the same is true here. These jumps are very small and not significant. Okay? But at the acceptable boundary, the jumps are large. So what it really means is that Principles on opposite sides of the exemplary and recognized boundaries are being treated very similarly, whereas principles on the opposite sides of the unacceptable and acceptable boundaries are being treated very differently. Even principles who did almost, whose schools performed almost the same. And here's the estimates of salary effects. You see at the recognized boundary and the exemplary boundary, those are basically zeros. Okay? Whereas Crossing the acceptable boundary is associated with 6% higher salary. So potential channels that contribute to the effect of an unacceptable rating. One is the lack of information on the underlying pass rates. Um, and our view is that the absence of any discontinuities at the recognized and exemplary threshold suggests that districts do have information on the underlying pass rates. They're not treating people differently. Um, voluntarily principal departures to avoid oversight and restrictions that follow multiple years of unacceptable rating. And what we show is <coughs> that the top row here is principals previously rated unacceptable. You have around negative 0 0.30. There's not very many working in schools that were previously rated unacceptable. So it's a very noisy estimate. But if you just look down here as the much larger group of principals who were in schools that were not going to be subject to these kinds of threat, uh, sanctions because it was the first year the school was placed in the unacceptable category, they were still much, much less likely um, to be retained if their school fell below the acceptable threshold. Um, other potential channels that contribute to the effect of an unacceptable rating and consistent with the kind of newspaper article and experience on the school board is that school board members or parents demand action in response to an unacceptable rating. And, you know, as I said, that's consistent with anecdotal evidence. We cannot separate that, however, from the fact that an unacceptable rating could just cause principals to want to get out of the school. We don't have the information that we would love to have on who initiated the separation. Um, an important question in terms of the merits of the system or the value of the system is 
If the ratings cause some principals to leave, is that likely to be helpful for the school? And that's only going to be helpful if it disproportionately causes the less effective principals to leave. And as, as I said earlier, as people have discussed extensively, No Child Left Behind is about status, not about quality of learning uh, or quantity of learning. And so it may well be the case that it does a poor job differentiating between effective and ineffective educators. So the one problem is the boundary themselves is separating people who do about the same job. But if you're using the rating to judge people, then you really want it to be the case that on average, the principals who are working in schools rated unacceptable are doing a far less effective job than the ones you know, who are in schools rated acceptable. And we can't do a good job of, of measuring what the principals actually do, but at least you'd like to see, I think, more learning to be taking place in the schools that are rating, rated acceptable than those rated unacceptable. So we measure the amount um, principal effectiveness on the basis of how much, how much on average during the time a principal is working in a school, her own school or Another, a current school or combined with a former school, the average value added for her. And we compare that in a complicated way to other principals who have worked in the same school or what we call a connected network of schools, so schools in which educators are rotating among. And what we show is the following. The right-hand graph looks at the distributions of the pass rate by ratings category. And there, obviously, because ratings are based on pass rate, you see the average pass rate much lower in the, unaccept in the unacceptable school. And the distributions move to the right. And the very tall, narrow one to the right is the distribution of pass rates in schools rated exemplary. Now, if you go over here, you see a very different picture. And that is these. You know, these distributions are virtually on top of one another. Now, there is the unacceptable rated schools are a little, have a little higher probability of being a bit more of a larger tail in the left. So really, really poor performing schools. Very, very, you know, low achievement. But the median is not very different among the categories. And even you know, the distribution heading to the right, they're almost on top of one another. So it's evident that um, these ratings do a poor job of differentiating schools on the basis of effectiveness, at least as measured by value added to achievement. OK. And um, here it's simply trying to estimate <laughs> the relationship between the probability of retention and the change in log salary um, on the principal fixed effect, which is our measure of value added. Why should that affect whether a principal stays or raise? That's not part of the system that, on the basis of which they're judged. Districts don't, ha districts don't actually have this information, though it could be related to observations of principals and other feedback if, in fact, their observation system is related to what we're measuring as test score improvement. What you can see is, is the unacceptable rating lowers the probability of retention. An exemplary rating has a, has a significant positive effect on, on salary growth for principals. And the pass rate, the pass rate itself, the continuous pass rate, is strongly related to salary growth. These aren't causal. We don't know that dis districts are looking at this and then determining raises. But a higher raise is associated with a higher pass rate and an exemplary rating. OK. Um, we should stop and so we have five minutes or so of questions, I guess. Um, so let me just say that this part, um, I'll quickly look at this. This is the regression discontinuity estimates, the same kind of things, but looking differently 
um, at the probability a, a principal has success in the labor market in their own district versus the probability of them getting a good job in another district. And we can't find much on other districts because we have a very sm only small fraction of principals who move to another district. Um, so I want to leave, I'm not going to talk about that much. The one thing that I think is interesting is if you look at the probability of being successful in the labor market, which means either you kept your job or you, you got a, a salary increase that was above the median or you had an increase in predicted achievement of your students above the median, that is significantly related to our estimate of value added. So there's some suggestive evidence that if you do better in terms of raising test scores, you're going to be rewarded with a higher probability of keeping your job um, um, or, or getting a bigger raise. That's also associated with a higher pass rate. All of these things are connected with success within the district. <coughs> so it's interesting because the rating is easily visible inside or outside the district. One of the hard things, though, is you don't learn so much here because we just don't have enough. There aren't enough principals who take jobs in other districts for us to get precise estimates of what those districts would appear to value. OK, so summary, little or no discontinuity in labor market outcomes at the recognized and exemplary boundaries. Crossing the acceptable boundary raises retention and salary growth. And the pattern of estimates suggests that pressure for the district to respond to an unacceptable rating is a driving force, though we can't rule out the role of voluntary quits in response to the school being labeled unacceptable. Um, the ratings based on pass rates fail to sort principles by effectiveness as measured by value added. Um, however, many effective principles with high value added receive an unacceptable rating. There's lots of principles with high value added that get an unacceptable rating. There's lots of principles with low value added that receive an exemplary rating. It's a little bit about what was discussed earlier about the fact that, you know, in the middle class or upper middle class schools, there are a lot of schools where there doesn't seem to be um, much um, achievement growth taking place. Okay. An unacceptable rating induces a response and raises the probability of job separations. Um, and labor market outcomes are also significantly related to these other pieces of information that are publicly made available. Um, basing accountability system on metrics more closely aligned with learning, such as metrics based on multiple measures, achievement growth, or other things that are more closely related to schools moving kids toward positive outcomes, um, could essentially elicit a much more positive you know, given that they would likely elicit a response, it could much, elicit a much more positive response in terms of rewarding um, more effective principals and not rewarding um, less effective educators. And it would also treat schools serving disadvantaged children much more fairly and not disadvantage them so much in the labor market. Okay. All right, thank you. I don't want to monopolize, uh, monopolize questioning, uh, but um, uh, ha this was really interesting. H how do you factor into your analysis, especially at the end, as you said, um, uh, the goal or a goal is to align uh, principal evaluations to student outcomes. How do you uh, factor in the fact that principals in most traditional district schools don't have a lot of power over a lot of the drivers of student outcomes like man hiring, firing, managing their staff, managing their budget, uh, defining their curricula, et cetera. So I think you're, you know, on the one hand, I think that's important. It probably, it lessens the importance of having a better principal if they're operating in a system where you know, they're, they're just keeping things going. On the other hand, my guess is that having someone who's good at, you know, at supporting instruction, who does a good job in terms of trying to, trying to manipulate their staff, even if they may be limited, um, you know, they, they probably are important. That said, I think, I think a real challenge is that the kind of outcomes we care about, 
are things like how well is somebody going to do in, in the next level of schooling? How well do they do? How well do people do in the labor market, you know, particularly if they're not going to go to college? You know, is, is there a sense in which people are better, you know, better prepared for citizenry or less likely to engage in criminal behavior? So there is a sense which you'd like to incorporate longer term outcomes in your evaluation system, but that's hard to do when you're trying to judge the person now. And I think that, that balance merits more attention. Um, I'm curious in terms of the timeline. So principals learn that they got a, a rating slightly lower than the one they were hoping for in August. Do they have time between that and the fall test cycle to kind of try to drum up uh, better achievement at their school? Do you see that in the data? So I guess the, the question is, if, you, if your school is rated unacceptable and you stay, can you raise the rating for the subsequent year, right? And I guess the answer to that is yes. I think the problem is, is that rating won't come out until the school has already made a decision about whether you're going to be retained. Do you think the test scores drop down when you get there? Um, so the test scores, so that's interesting. So the test scores, the tests are taken in the spring. They come out slightly earlier in the summer. So, but better districts have already made their decisions, you know, for, you know, for some of the large urban districts, they're often hiring people at the last minute. But I, I think that it's probably, you know, it, it's probably the case in, in most places that it's hard to imagine the rating is going to affect you what happens two weeks later. I'll be quick. <laughs> I think it's really interesting, Steve. Um, uh, I'm curious if you looked for, I guess, what would be called heterogeneous treatment effects. If you looked at the wealthier districts, would they pay a bigger premium for exemplary, say, than whatever the next lowest level was? I know you're not finding in the aggregate, but I'm wondering uh, if the willingness to pay for quality recognition might be higher. Um. So I think, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think the the difficulty is those districts may be more sophisticated and recognize that the boundaries aren't what's important, that the underlying information is more important. And then we get back into the sort of non-causal world. So I think we'd like to, we are going to try to, to divide things up by super sizes of the district, even across different superintendents to see, to see about information use. So, so we're, we are going to explore those, and I think share of low-income kids is another one we could do. All right. So while Hugh is walking over, I have a quick question for you as well. Okay. So you, uh, so there are these thresholds. Usually, when there's to be a decision to be made, for example, to get rid of the principal or to change the organization, typically you, m you use a threshold rule. So there has to be some sort of threshold to make a decision. So you, what we're doing is moving away from a very strong threshold to sort of a fuzzy a range in which you could make a decision. So why is the alternative better than keeping a threshold rule? Well, it, I think it, it seems like you could have lots of information and, and you'd want to pass judgments about you know, who's better or who's worse. But even if this were the only piece of information, it's not clear you'd want to make a sharp cutoff um, at the threshold given to you by the state. You'd want to know what your labor market is and all. You know, our view is that maybe it's very difficult for districts to make these decisions, and yet it becomes, they become pushed into it when, you know, when it becomes public that they got this, they have to wear the U, you know, so to speak. <laughs>